edition of the Sports Line Podcast, and we certainly appreciate you hanging out with us. Now, although we love to feature athletes, sports executives, and broadcasters who represent or are getting it done in Southern Ontario, today, due to the Olympics and Paralympics in Paris, we've opened up our scope to the national sports scene. Getting his start on the largely popular sports page program in Vancouver, this individual took his producing and broadcast talents to Toronto for a long stint at Sportsnet. Since then, John Horn has moved on to become one of the country's top sports television and radio professionals on and off the camera. Although he's covered everything from the NFL to the NBA, this individual has worked seven Olympic Games, with this year's Games in Paris being his first exclusively covering his true love tennis let's visit paris and bring him in from roland garros it's john horn how are you partner bonjour bubs comment ça va <laughs> i'm doing well <laughs> my friend i'm not gonna good, fake good, the good. funk here with the french <laughs> but that's i'm certainly as much as you're gonna get that's the most you're gonna get out of me in france so that's, that's about it <laughs> hey tell you i'm gonna start off with this a simple question uh, you've been the olympics and now the paralympics which are starting very soon what is Paris like as an Olympic city? I mean, there's some great tradition here. I mean, we, we talk about the Olympics and the history that it has with Greece, obviously. Uh, Paris hosted the Games in 1924, so this is the 100-year anniversary of uh, hosting the Games. So a pretty special uh, moment for everybody here in Paris, and uh, I thought they did a great job with the Olympic Games. Uh, I thought it was really well organized. Some of the venues were spectacular. Uh, they did a nice job uh, in all different aspects. Uh, I thought the medals looked uh, really nice. I thought that the competitions were really good. Uh, there were some great stories, some good Canadian stories, some good stories from other countries as well. Uh, and so we're looking to parlay that into the into the Paralympics as well. Uh, there's lots of great stories here uh, from the Paralympics. I'm doing wheelchair tennis. Um, you know, when you see some of these athletes, Bubs, uh, it's really impressive to see what they can do. Uh, the inspirational stories, uh, the strength uh, that you see in wheelchair tennis tennis just the upper body strength that you need to to wheel the court to wheel on the court uh it, it's pretty cool so um I'm, I'm glad to be here this is uh the second third event i guess i've done involving wheelchair tennis before i've done special olympic tennis para games before in the past but this is the first time i've done tennis and para tennis on site uh, at an olympic game so uh it's it's pretty cool and uh there are lots of great stories and i hope uh, it gets the attention that it deserves uh, it's a great city to host it and uh, I think the ticket sales are going to be great, too. They've already been saying at the tennis that they're about 80% full already uh, for most of the courts, which is nice. And, uh, you know, this stadium we're at right now, uh, Philippe Chatrier uh, seats 15,000. Uh, there's another 9,000 on Suzanne Leglon. So I think it's, uh, it's going to go really well. And uh, I'm glad that uh, Paris has done a nice job showcasing uh, the Olympic Games and now the um, Paralympic Games to the world. You know, and, and for those, I know, I know this is really nothing new to you. You've covered the French Open for many years. You've covered major Grand Slam tournaments. Like, you're standing at Roland Garros right now. We're getting a good look of it right now. I mean, does this bring any special memories to you when you go to that, that clay court, the home of clay? Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you right now. I'm concerned about my shoes because there's a lot of dirt and a lot of clay around here, and I'm wearing <laughs> white shoes, so I'm a little concerned. <laughs> Um, no, but to be honest with you, yeah, I mean, it's it's a spectacular venue. Uh, obviously, it's one of the meccas of tennis, uh, along with Wimbledon. Uh, there's so many others, but uh, the French Open really, uh, for clay court tennis, is the mecca, with all due respect, uh, to Rome and Monte Carlo and Barcelona, who have had storied tournaments as well. But this is the, the third Grand Slam of the year, and uh, I think it's really cool and unique that, you know, again, like in London in 2012, where uh, the Olympics were on the grass and they transformed all of Wimbledon into an Olympic event and uh, it didn't look like Wimbledon at all. It's the same here uh, with Paris. You can see over my shoulder that uh, Paris 2024, you see all the blue around, uh, usually at Roland Garros, that's uh, you know brown and green. So it's a completely different look uh, for the players. And uh, they've done an excellent job here of uh, making it a comfortable uh, place for the wheelchair athletes and the, the Olympians as well. Um, and, I, I, you know, it, it's, it's a storied uh, court. I mean, there have been so many great matches on this court. You think of how many times Nadal has won uh, the French Open. I think it's 14. There's a, a huge statue made uh, of Nadal not far from where I'm standing. Um, you know, Alcaraz winning winning uh, the French Open. Gustavo Cuerton winning it a couple times. Federer has won it. Uh, Djokovic has won it. Uh, and just recently, Alcaraz. So, I mean, there's so many other great stories. Iga Shrontek's won it three times, too. Um, so, 
it's it's a it's a very special court. Uh, it's a very unique court. Uh, it's a little different for wheelchair tennis because uh, the wheelchairs need to be a little bit more firm on the court, so they don't water it as much. Um, and it's it's a little more difficult for the wheelchair athletes to maneuver around than it would be on the hard courts and the and the grass. But uh, they're doing a great job of looking after the court, and uh, the players have all said that it's playing really well, at least on Philippe Chatrier. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's a great it's a great stadium. I mean to be standing here, roofs open right now, which is nice. Uh, they do have a retractable roof now. Uh, it's it's you know you sometimes pinch yourself. But, uh, when you get to be at these places and have these moments. And uh, certainly I think the athletes will, uh, will feel the same way. You know, let's go back to the Olympics for a second here because there was a couple of moments and you just listed off some of the great names in tennis. And I want to, it's becoming arguable right now if Novak Djokovic is the greatest male singles tennis player of all time. He's won multiple Grand Slams. I think he's up to 23 or whatever the case is. What Novak Djokovic, had a, a reaction I went after winning the gold medal in men's singles that I've never seen him have before. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. sure you saw that. What, what, why did he react that way? I mean, I think uh, the Olympic Games to some athletes uh, means more than it does to others. Uh, I think in some sports it means more than it does to others. I think anybody who has the opportunity to compete in the Olympic Games, uh, it's a it's a special moment. I think any athlete will say that. Um, but I think in terms of you know what it means to Djokovic, uh, representing its country uh, in the sport of tennis has always been a big deal. Whether it's been in Davis Cup, uh, ATP Cup, um, you know any events that involve his country. Um, you know tennis players are individuals first. They have a country and a flag beside their name. Uh, but really in tennis, they're individuals. They just happen to be from a country. There are not that many moments and opportunities where a player uh, plays a sport in tennis and represents their country. Uh, so I think, you know, he's he's won the Davis Cup before. That meant a lot to him. Uh, he's won multiple Grand Slams, as you just listed off. Uh, he's had a lot of achievements, great moments. Uh, you know, there's there's so many. You could spend half an hour just talking about how, how many events he's won and why he's won it and how great they've been. Uh, but to win a gold medal was something that he had never done. Uh, he'd won a bronze medal in, in Beijing. Uh, he had lost uh, in previous Olympics in early rounds. And I think it really bothered him that he wasn't able to to get that gold medal. And this was almost probably going to be his last chance, being 37 years old. Um, and just, you know, how difficult it had been. He'd had it, he hurt his knee in the French Open, pulled out of the French Open, um, went to Wimbledon, got all the way to the final, lost to Alcaraz quite handily. Um, and then he went through the draw here at the French Open on a court that he obviously he plays at Chatrier almost every match. I think he did at the Olympics because he's either been the number one seed or defending champion or what have you. And I just think that he he, he put a great match together uh, and a great week together. Um, I even thought that when he was scheduled to play Alcaraz in the final that, you know, I didn't think he I thought he had a chance, but I didn't think he was going to win. And he played some outstanding tennis at moments and won in straight sets and tie breaks. And uh, I think it was almost like the weight of the last thing that he needed to accomplish in tennis had come off of his shoulders. And that solidified him officially, whether people agreed or not, or not before this, that he was officially the greatest of all time in men's tennis and probably in professional tennis overall. Um, it was almost as if he won for his country. So that was a big moment. He's now the greatest of all time. That was a big moment. He won a gold medal. That was a big moment. Has he accomplished everything in sport now? Yes. And it all came down uh, at that moment. And that was why he reacted the way he did. His family was in the crowd. His kids were in the crowd. His wife was there. People from his country were surrounded uh, the court. There were a lot of Serbian fans here. Um, you know, to see him on the ground, you know, with his hands shaking and trembling, uh, that was shaking and trembling of joy, not because he was upset. Uh, so I, it, it just, I think it all culminated in that moment. And uh, to do it on this court where he's won slams before, uh, I think was a special moment. And, uh, you know, it was it was certainly a cool moment for tennis. And uh, now he's got his own gold bag, Bubs. I don't know if you've seen that. It's a, <laughs> it's a gold bag that he's had made up by uh, either Head or somebody, I can't remember who, who made it up, but... Uh, and he's walking into the U.S. Open in uh, the last Grand Slam of the year with a gold bag now. So he's made it, I think. <laughs> well, the Serbs certainly got a great feeling. And it was certainly, I think, a real warm feeling. We don't normally pay a lot of attention to doubles, especially mixed doubles. But what happened with Gabby Dabrowski and uh, Felix Oja Aliassime with that bronze medal, that, that was a real thumbs up, I thought, for Canadian tennis and a great moment for us. 
Yeah, it was a great moment. Uh, I was lucky I got to see some of those matches. Uh, I watched the bronze medal match, um, and it was nice to see because Canada hadn't won a medal in tennis since 2000 uh, when Daniel Nestor and Sebastian Leroux won the gold in Sydney in doubles. So it was nice to have that moment. Uh, Felix had another shot at a bronze, uh, wasn't able to to win it in singles, but still to, to get that moment um, in mixed doubles, uh, you know, is a, is a very cool moment. And I think Gabby Dabrowski, for all that she's done, you know, I would say that the doubles players never get the attention that the singles players do, uh, whether it was Grant Connell back in the days uh, or Daniel Nestor uh, from a men's perspective. Um, you know, they achieve some great moments in tennis, some of the best doubles players of all time. And, you know, when we talk about tennis, just like we did here today, we're always talking about the singles players and Djokovic and Shabovalov and Felix and so forth and Bianca. And the doubles kind of takes a back seat. And, it doesn't get the exposure. It's not on TV as much. But uh, what Gabby Dabrowski has been able to do in, in uh, women's tennis has been impressive. I mean, she's the number one seed uh, with her partner, Aaron Routliff, who's the number one doubles player in the world. The fact that they've been able to have such a good run uh, for in such a short period of time. Uh, you know, they won the U.S. Open last year. They got to the, the doubles uh, final in Canada this year. Uh, they won a couple of other tournaments in between. So, um, you know, it's a nice moment for her to, to win a bronze medal and to represent her country. And she's always been there uh, at Billie Jean King Cup and Fed Cup before it was called Billie Jean King Cup. And, um, you know, has always worn the Canadian colors uh, with pride. And I think for her and Felix, uh, it was a nice moment to get to have together. Uh, they hadn't played a lot of doubles before together, so for them to be able to do it uh, and bring a medal home for Canada was pretty cool. Over to the Paralympic Games right now, uh, and just for a little history, um, not so much for who to look for as of yet, but th the actual tennis is, as a sport in the Paralympics, uh, is, it, is it a relatively new sport to the Paralympic Games? Yeah, I mean, it's been going since 2004, I believe. Um, so, yeah, I guess you would call it relatively new. I mean, wheelchair tennis has been going for quite some time. Uh, 1982, I believe, I believe it was France who, uh, who first started off uh, getting wheelchair tennis uh, going. Um, but it, it's, had a, it's had a cool, uh, uh, you know, a good run, I should say. I mean, uh, the, the fact that they're in all the Grand Slams, I think, is, is outstanding. I mean, they're not in the U.S. Open this year because of the Olympics. So unfortunate that both the U.S. Open and the Paralympics are going on at the same time. Um, but I found it interesting. I, I was concerned because I read a couple of articles that uh, the athletes weren't going to, you know, they, the, the money that they earn at Grand Slams often funds them for a lot, lot of the year um, and that they weren't going to get money from um, the U.S. Open this year because they weren't having it. But it turns out that uh, the U.S. Open uh, pulled a really solid uh, gesture and has actually pooled all the prize money that the players would have got at U.S. Open uh, and is actually still giving it to the players. And they are distributing it, distributing it out evenly amongst all the players. So it's a nice uh, gesture from the U.S. Open to do that. So they're getting all their money and they're getting to compete uh, for gold, silver, and bronze here in uh, Paris. So I think that's a nice touch. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's a it's a, it's an impressive sport to watch, Bubs. I mentioned that earlier, and the fact that uh, you know you're able to maneuver around a tennis court. Um, you know, in a wheelchair, it's a specially designed wheelchair for tennis. It's not your standard wheelchair. The, the wheels are sort of curved in a little bit. Um, and, you know, there are a few couple different rules. I mean, the sets are still the same. The net height is still the same. Um, the difference is you get two balls. Uh, you get a two ball bounce instead of one like you would in tennis. Um, so that's really the only difference. And, uh, you know, some of the athletes, the muscles, uh, you know, you, you, anybody who you know who's a well-known wheelchair athlete, uh, you think back to like when Rick Hansen was the you know, man in motion around the world the arms on rick hansen was just they were impressive so uh when you see some of these uh wheelchair athletes and the strength that they have uh to wheel around and to hit the ball and there's some players who really hit the ball hard and are really good players and um you know there's some players who, who won all the grand slams uh alfie hewitt from great britain is an example of that uh, you know there's been some really good players over the years who've, who've really competed at a high level so uh it's fun to watch again it's kind of like a sport maybe like like doubles it doesn't get the attention um that it probably Probably should or maybe would like but certainly it's getting more and more exposure um, than it ever has so uh, if you get the opportunity to watch some of the coverage I'm sure there'll be some wheelchair tennis coverage in there um, and hopefully uh, hopefully Canada will bring back a medal at Robert Shaw's in the quad singles event so uh, maybe we'll see another uh, medal coming home uh, on the courts of Roland Garros. Well, okay you talk about the Canadian there so when you say quad tennis what does that mean to us new newbies? 
Yeah, well, it's it's different. I mean, there, there's six different categories uh, here at uh, the wheelchair tennis. There's singles and there's doubles, uh, men's and women's, and then there's also quad singles and quad doubles. And what the difference it really is between uh, between the the bunch, obviously singles is singles and doubles is doubles. But the difference between say wheelchair doubles, the open division, uh, and the quad division is that there's usually a, a limb deficiency that one of the players actually has. So usually that means that um, you know a player has lost a full limb um, and. And oftentimes, Bubs, it's pretty impressive that you'll see some of the players in the quad division uh, actually playing with a racket taped to their hand because they can't, they don't have the shoulder mobility to actually move their hand. So um, that, again, makes it even more special when you see some of the players. So it can be different deficiencies that, that the players have, different limbs that uh, they have lost or what have you. It could be arms, could be legs. Um, but that's the difference between quad uh, quad singles and the uh, the open division and the quad division. So um, that's what Robert Shaw is in. And uh, you know, he's a pretty good player. So uh, I'd like to see him do well. He, he's, he's, got a, he's got a tough draw. Uh, if he wins his first round match, he's got to play the number two seed. So um, there are a lot of a lot of really good Dutch uh, wheelchair players, a lot of really good Japanese uh, wheelchair players, um, and Great Britain seems to show well too. So um, you know, I guess it boils down to a lot of it is funding and court be having the ability to play and what courts you can play on. But uh, you know, as I said, uh, I emphasized it before, is that the the it's really inspiring to watch when you you think every day of um, you know how some of these uh, some of these athletes you know what they go through just to live a normal life um, day to day and then you see them competing at an event like this at a high level uh, at the Olympics uh, it's really cool. You know, you know, John. I, let's switch things over to the to the U.S. Open by, at Flushing Meadows because something happened yesterday which. I'm, it blew my mind, and I was a little disappointed that we had five Canadians in one day, but four of them played on Tuesday at Flushing Meadow, and it was amazing to me that all of them lost. I, should we be shocked here? I mean, yes and no. Uh, I mean, no Canadians played on the first day, and then five of them played on the second day, and four of them lost. And the four that uh, you figured should have won, won, and the one that uh, ended up winning, uh, you know, you thought probably would have lost. So um, kind of backwards the way it all went. Uh, look, it's been a tough uh, bit of a run here for the Canadians uh, in uh, in tennis, in singles especially. Uh, Felix Oje, Ali Sim, Denis Shapovalov, Bianca Andreescu, Leilani Fernandez. Uh, it has not been a good year for any of them. They've really struggled to put runs together. Um, you know, that said, uh, Bianca did get to one final. So did uh, Leilani Fernandez got to a final. So did Felix. He got to a final. Um, you know, Felix was in Madrid on the clay. Bianca's, I believe, was in Berlin. No, it was in uh, the Netherlands on grass. And then uh, Leilani Fernandez was on Eastbourne on grass. So, you know, good results. But certainly, I think the, the problem is, is that when the Canadian players have had better results than that, where, you know, Felix Oje, Ali Sim is gone to a semifinal at a Grand Slam. Uh, Denis Shapovalov has gone to a Wimbledon uh, semifinal. Um, and Leilani Fernandez has been a U.S. Open runner-up. And Bianca Andreescu has won the U.S. Open. Uh, once that starts happening, then you start expecting the results to come exactly the same way. And uh, it just hasn't. And uh, for a number of reasons, uh, I know Shapovalov has been injured. Uh, Bianca Andreescu has been injured again. She's been back, but hasn't had great results since. Um, it's It's been tough for for you know, the Canadians to just muster up a lot of wins. And I don't know if it's, you know, I mean, I've been paying attention to it, but I'm not in their camps. I know uh, Andrescu has gone with a new coach. Felix Auger, Ali Asim hasn't. And some people are saying that he, it's about time that he should. Uh, he should change his coach. Um, Denis Shapovalov is bouncing around from coaches to coaches. Uh, Leila Annie Fernandez is still with her father. Some people will say that she should get another voice in her box. Um, so it's really it's really been tough for, uh, for all of them. They just haven't been able to either stay healthy or put wins together. Um, and it, the expectations that, uh, you know, rightly so, they put on themselves for doing so well, um, you know, getting back to 2019, 2021, 2022. But the last two years have really been a struggle for both of them. It's uh, for all four of them, rather, and singles. And, uh, you know, hopefully they can turn it around. Uh, you know, Canadian tennis is, was really peaking at one point, And I think the interest level is still there. But uh, it's tough when uh, all four players, um, you know, who you expect to at least play a couple of matches at the U.S. Open, they're 
go deeper, some of them, uh, for Felix and uh, Leilani Fernandez especially, um, for them not to do that and to lose so uh, easily, uh, quite frankly, to players that they all could have beaten. Uh, I know Andrescu um, has he's played Jasmine Paolini three times in a row at three slams, which is totally crazy, including <laughs> uh, at this tournament, uh, un unreal. Um, but, you know, they're, they're players that can be beaten, and uh, and I think uh, Leilani Fernandez will be disappointed with the way she's played recently and the way that she lost uh, in three sets to a player that she probably should have beaten. Uh, Denis Shapovalov has just been all over the place this year and not been good tennis, and Felix Oje Alisim lost to a good player, but he lost in straight sets. Uh, he should at least be going four or five with a player um, like that. So um, disappointing overall and unfortunate, but uh, that's tennis. It uh, tells you the depth of the tours and how good uh, you have to be just to win a first-round match, whether you're seated or whether you've had a run or whether you haven't. Can I get back to Andrescu for a second there? And I know there's a lot of people asking this question. 2019 winner of that tournament. How does she get to end up with a uh, facing a five seed in the first round? <laughs> Well, it's a combination of things, Bubs. Uh, Paolini has had a great year, as we talked about. Uh, won Dubai, uh, got to the French Open final, got to the Wimbledon final, so she she's the number five seed. Uh, and Bianca Andreescu just really hasn't had the matches this year and hasn't been able to get her ranking up uh, into the top 32 in the world. So uh, if you're a top 32 player, uh, you get seeded in the top 32 of the tournament, and then you avoid the, the better players just because you're seeded. You're, I think the likelihood is you don't get a seed until the third round at earliest uh, if you're in the top 32. So, uh, I mean, it, I'm, I'm totally crazy that she drew Paolini all three tournaments at the French Wimbledon and the U.S. Open. Uh, I mean, that that is unheard of to, to do something like that. Uh, you, you do not see that very often, uh, if at all. And, uh, you know, so unfortunate for her. But the fact that even though she's a U.S. Open champion, that doesn't mean that she gets a higher seed and she gets into the draw and, and has, a, has a better chance of going deeper into the draw. Uh, this is the, the, the tough part about tennis is, you know, we saw it with Dominic Team. He won. He won the U.S. Open a few years ago, and uh, you know he bowed out in the first round. I mean, he barely got into the tournament. I think he got a wild card to get in, if I if I remember. Um, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past uh, in tennis. They're they're interested in what you're doing now, and uh, you're seeing a lot of former great players, uh, Slam winners, uh, Vavrinka uh, being one of them. Um, you know, you, you see these guys who've won Slams before. Dominic Team has done it, uh, and then they've been down the rankings either because they've been injured or they just can't get back into the top 30 or the top 50 or what have you. Uh, so then they draw tough players. Uh, Emma Raducanu, same thing that she won the U.S. Open and she's out in the first round. Just can't get that ranking up high enough uh, to avoid. Good players uh, although i thought you know she could have played better uh, in her u.s open loss but um you know it, this is how this is the sport of tennis and why it's sometimes cruel is that you can go on these runs for a couple of years you can get into the top 10 uh then you suddenly just get an injury and uh you're right back down at the bottom and you have to work your way up and some players are good at doing that and other players don't and uh amanda nisimova is another player who took some time off of tennis and uh came back and got to the final uh in toronto in a 1000 event which was remarkable for her and then you know, misses Cincinnati, goes to the U.S. Open, and boom, just like that, just out of the first round. So <laughs> her little run has come to an end. So it's uh, it's tough. Uh, it's tough for for the players, and um, and that's basically what happened to Andrescu. Just didn't have the matches and hadn't got a high enough ranking, and so she has to grind it out. And uh, but players can do it. I mean, uh, Alexander Zverev did it on this court. He walked out on crutches, or you know, and walk out. He walked out in a wheelchair, I suppose, or got pushed out in a wheelchair. Um, you know, was out for six, eight months, and then came back and had to fight all his way back and now he's in the top five in the world again so it can be done uh that's what makes those players great so we'll see what andrescu can do but uh it's certainly a tough road to, to climb when uh, the players just keep getting stronger and stronger and you think of the five years that since she won the u.s open how much deeper the the women's uh the women's field has gotten it's just gotten deeper and deeper and uh, it makes it even harder now for for players who have won to continue winning and you just have to be better and better players it's tough Real quick, give me a winner for the U.S. Open on the men's and the ladies' side singles. We're going to go out on a limb, Bubs, and we're going to go Djokovic in the men's, and we're going to go Sabalenka in the women's. Go wow. Real long shots, though. Wow, look at you. <laughs> real You're a real, real, real Motor shots. City gambler, eh? <laughs> yeah, real, real long shots. Look, I mean, I, I, the only thing that I, I would have said Alcaraz, but the Alcaraz uh, ankle turn kind of worried me a little bit. He says he's fine. Uh, he won his first round match, but he did lose a set. Um, I don't know. I just, 
is something about Djokovic and just the, the this all this stuff that just happens. I mean, this would be, I think, 25 for him. This would give him the most ever. I believe it's 25. Um, would give him the most ever uh, passing Margaret Court. Again, another monumental record that he would have. I mean, that, again, would just solidify the 10th time over that he's the greatest of all time. Um, but I just think he's he's just, you know, he's such a good player, even though he's got a bit of his knees injury is bothering him. Maybe uh, he certainly knows how to get through matches. And he, he, he uh, the U.S. Open, he's won multiple times, so he knows how to win there. And I just like Sabalenka, I like the way that she plays. Uh, I think that she's, uh, she's you know, I think she's a better player than Sviantek, in my opinion. Wow. Um, I think wow. she hits the ball harder. I think she hits the ball harder. Um, Sviantek is a great player, but she's also a clay court specialist. And, uh, you know, she's won other slams before, but she doesn't play as well on the grass. And, uh, you know, I think Sabalenka, what makes her good is that she can play on all three, all four surfaces or all three surfaces, four if you include indoor, five if you include green clay. Um, but uh, I think that she's just a better player. Um, she's got her serve sorted out uh, for the last couple of years. She hits the ball a ton. Um, and she's just, you see her on the other, she's a, she's a, she's a, a, a force out on the other side of the court. But uh, she's certainly a player that can uh, that can dominate the sport, and she has been dominating the sports. And I actually think that's why I like her. I just think that she she's coming off winning Cincinnati too um, a couple weeks ago, so uh, that's why I picked her, Bugs. Hey, John, this has been spectacular, giving us really the inside track on professional tennis, and of course what's been happening at the Olympics and the Paralympics. Enjoy uh, another couple of weeks in Paris. I mean, this has been probably an outstanding time for you, and thanks for giving us that great shot there of Roland Garros. It's, it's so great to see, um, and great to see a, a Canadian like yourself giving us such great coverage. And uh, good luck in your adventure here in Paris. Bob, as I appreciate it, I went restaurant the other night highly recommended to me you had been there i asked your name and then they got me right in so i don't know you got some pull in i didn't realize that it's impressive <laughs> hey buddy thanks so much we really appreciate the time all right folks there you go yet another adventure Paris on the Sportsline podcast. If you do know of an athlete, team, or event that deserves some attention, we are certainly here for you. Look us up on many of CHCH's social media platforms, and while you're at it, please comment, subscribe, and blast that thumbs up button because we appreciate your feedback for the talented peeps that make this podcast possible. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow.